Welcome to season four of Flipping the Table with Michael Reed Dimmock and Roots of Change. We took a hiatus for most of 2021 due to immense amount of work related to impacts on the food system, resulting from climate change and the pandemic. We're back at it in 2022 to bring you more honest conversations about food, farming, and the future. Our first few episodes will cover some of the Roots of Change work in 2021 that we think you'll find of interest. We appreciate the support from the Ladybug Foundation and our individual contributors like Quincy and Dan Imhoff, Beth and Mark Wyatt, Cindy Daniel and Doug Lipton, and many others who make our podcast possible. We hope you'll enjoy season four. Hello, this is Michael. Maricela Morales is the executive director of the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy, otherwise known as CAUSE. Maricela and her organization are the primary ally in the Achieving Resilient Communities Project. Roots of Change is one of those programs, along with Tracking California, the Public Health Alliance of Southern California, and Science for Toxics Exposure Prevention. Our goal is to protect farm workers and their families from heat illness, which is now recognized as the primary threat to human life, resulting from the extreme heat events caused by global warming. This is a pilot project with one focal point so far, and that is the farm worker community living in Oxnard, which is a coastal town in Ventura County. Maricela has been our frontline guide and advisor on how to succeed in positively impacting the lives of farm worker families, a primary component of the people she serves in Ventura, Santa Barbara, and San Luis Obispo counties. As you will hear in this conversation, Maricela is passionate, fierce, and very thoughtful about how to make changes that will improve the lives of primarily immigrant families suffering most from the injustices of our modern American economy. Her lived experience as a Latina in Ventura County, combined with a Stanford education, a graduate degree in psychology, and her former role as the mayor of Port Huynimi, a small town south of Oxnard, provides her a broad and piercing perspective on the realities of our world and powerful insights into successful community power building and change making. I hope you'll enjoy our conversation about the Achieving Resilient Communities Project. Maricela, it's so great to be with you down here in Ventura County today in July on a warm day. Great to be talking with you. Thank you, Michael. It's wonderful to have you back in our community. You have some roots here. I have some roots. So it's great to have you here. Yeah, thanks. So we're going to talk all about the Achieving Resilient Communities Project, which we call the ARC Project. But before we do, I'd love for you to just tell our listeners about your organization, CAUSE, here on the Central Coast of California. Thank you. So CAUSE, the Central Coast Alliance, United for a Sustainable Economy, I've always liked that name, by the way. It's very clever. Right? (laughs) And even board members can't remember what it actually stands for. Oh, really? Wow. (laughs) Because it's so long. So cause, though, is great Mm -hmm. uh, shorthand for it. It's a people of color, Mm -hmm. created, led, and operated organization. Mm -hmm. We're very proud of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're celebrating 20 years this year. Um, We do community power building for social, economic, and environmental justice. That is our passion. Mm -hmm. And a little bit about what those words mean. So for us, our community is that of working class Mm -hmm. and immigrant communities of color. Here on the California's Central Coast, that is predominantly first and second generation Mexican immigrant. So we are absolutely in solidarity with our BIPOC siblings, Mm -hmm. brothers and sisters, community Mm -hmm. at large. Mm -hmm. And our reality here on the ground is uh, that uh, it's predominantly Mexican immigrant, first and second generation. And that includes people who are working in the minimum wage, non-unionized service, retail, domestic, and farm work. So that's that's our community at, at heart, right? Part of, of the bigger community. The heart of CAUSE's power building is base building. That's intensive one-on-one organizing. 
and uh, community-based committees with ongoing public leadership development. So our grassroots members are our leaders in public. CAUSE works on intersectional issues, immigrant rights, worker rights, housing and tenant rights, redistricting, environmental justice, and investing in youth of color. Wow. It's a huge mission. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I see the I see the results. I mean, just the last few days mm-hmm. being down here, uh, meeting from the interns who are out there doing citizen science today mm-hmm. with our crew, the kind of interim leaders that are guiding them. Mm. They're I, the incredibly uh, impressive. Asil and uh, um, Odette, who we met. Thank I you. mean, really, um, Yesenia, the the intern. I mean, they. I mean, it, it's heartwarming. Mm. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's powerful. beautiful. Yeah. So they're out there doing the work. So, mm-hmm. and how long you've been with Cause? Because it's as long as I've known you've been with Cause. Yes, uh, I'd like to say I'm a co-founder. Mm-hmm. I've been here from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not the founding executive director. That's Dr. Marcos Vargas. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I came on board um, at the very beginning mm-hmm. and uh, transitioned into the ED position in 2015. 2015. Mm-hmm. Wow. Amazing a bunch of years. You've lived through a lot here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I did describe the main intention of the ARC project in the introduction, but I'm very curious as to why you decided to commit mm-hmm. your valuable time and energy. Uh, to becoming really the most critical partner that we have in this project here in Ventura County. Like you are the the taproot uh, mm-hmm. for the project here and have been our uh, primary strategic guide through all the work we've been doing. So wh- why don't you describe why you made that decision to play? Absolutely, because as I shared, given all the issues that we work on, right, across two counties and we're part of statewide coalitions, our cup overrunneth. <laughs> <laughs> with wonderful projects, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there is so much more to do. So the reason why I thought that this was worthwhile to invest time and energy is because of the two, what I see as the two main factors in this project, the ARC project, and that's climate resiliency and farm workers. Mm-hmm. You know, climate crisis and the need for climate resiliency, that is on the top of many people's agenda, as it should be. But farm workers who are essential, as we've known through COVID, Mm -hmm. and at the root of every community, because we all eat. Mm -hmm. So at some point along the chain, they are at the root of every human community. Correct. Our farm workers, they are not at the top of most anyone's agenda. Mm -hmm. And without farm workers, we die. I mean, it it really is that literal. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, folks can have their own garden and so forth, but, you know, at the macro level. And and they're not on people's minds. So that's why I thought this was worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, and we couldn't have done it without you. Public Health Institute is an Oakland-based organization. We've got a lot of great people, but we're not in the community. So it doesn't work to bring technical assistance to any group if you're not in the community. Mm-hmm. So you have to be in the community, and you, you've brought that to us. And so, um, and, and what you brought to us was not only your own talents and your team's talents, but you've also brought us some very important partners. And uh, MICOP, Lideres Campesinas, and Encampment for Citizenship, you, you tapped us into all three of those organizations who are working with us. I mean, really on the front lines, doing a lot of amazing things. So I'm very curious why you picked those three organizations. Why did you recommend that we work with them? Thank you for this question, Michael, because power building is about leveraging the whole community. And we know that just as no one individual can fix uh, social problems, no one organization can either. Right? We do this collectively. We do this in coalitions. And uh, these three organizations love to lift them up because they are such important partners. So MICOP, Mixteco Indígena Community Organizing Project, mm-hmm. focuses on farm workers. Their mission is exclusively farm workers and specifically indigenous migrants. So in California, the growing core of the farm workers, as many as a million throughout the state, is indigenous migrants from southern Mexico, Oaxaca, Guerrero, Michoacan. 
And they have 20 years of experience serving the community in multitude of ways and also building the leadership capacity of Mixteco Indígena farm workers. And so they're essential. Líderes Campesinas, another organization that we're, we're blessed with, they've been around, started, you know, by a, a former farm worker, mm-hmm. Millie Trevino. I remember her. She was a rock fellow. Oh, okay. Many decades ago. That's right. You were the chair of the board at the time, I That's think. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So Líderes Campesinas was started by a farm worker, mm-hmm. a woman, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, to shine a light on the need, but also the leadership capacity of farm worker women specifically who face their own particular challenges in addition to the general challenges that farm workers face. They face sexual assault, sexual harassment. You know, they're particularly vulnerable. Um, Every human is to the uh, harmful hazardous pesticides that farm workers are exposed to. But as women, right, reproductively have yet another way that they're impacted. And so Lidas Campesinas, again, has a long track record right, of engaging the very women, in this case, farm workers, who are on the front lines throughout the state, and we're lucky that they are in Ventura County. Mm -hmm. And then the encampment for citizenship is new Mm -hmm. to our community, Mm -hmm. but not to this work. They are celebrating 75 years, started in New York, at a time where racial justice, racial inclusion was not a thing. This was back in the 40s. And they started that work back then. And so it's specifically with youth, bringing diverse youth from across the country together to learn about and become social agents of change. Mm -hmm. And so they're now in our community here in Ventura County, and they have engaged on agricultural issues, pesticides in particular, but other issues. And so they were also a natural. So we're really blessed and privileged to have these organizations in our community to partner with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and I have been so impressed by the different, you know, representatives, the, the team members. I think of Claudia from Lideres, who the other night co-hosted the event we had with the farm workers, and Jorge and Lucas from your team, mm-hmm. Juvenal from, from MICOP, and then, the, the, as I mentioned, Yesenia, who I think was also part of the encampment. I mean, I don't know how old they are, but they're they're all young compared to me, <laughs> and and they are smart, dynamic, know how to use technology, are totally motivated, mm-hmm. and want to be doing this work, and uh, that gives me a ton of you know good feeling about the future, the possibilities. Yes. So. We've got this team, a Mm -hmm. diverse team of groups that are connected to different elements of the community, different ages, uh, different populations. So why don't you describe the work we did with the farm workers, the actual farm workers that these organizations helped us pull together for a group of focus groups. What have we been doing with them? What did we understand from that engagement with them? Yes. So Líderes Campesinas and MICOP took the lead on bringing together farm workers to, you know, share information about climate change, about climate resiliency, and get their direct experience and input as to what they see as priorities around these issues. And in terms of the power building that we're all committed to, it it starts with what we call frontline communities. It starts with the very people who are on the front lines, (laughs) who are the ones that face uh, the same problems that the broader community could be facing in that particular community, but that have less resources, less protections, are not listened to, have a, a weaker political voice, in this case, because they're immigrants, because they're undocumented, because they're not English speakers in so many different ways. And so they're more vulnerable. So on the one hand, they're more burdened by environmental hazards and environmental pollution. Heat specifically and smoke in in these circumstances. So that's why it was important to start there. Mm -hmm. And what emerged from those conversations was a number of different concerns and opportunities and heat uh, rose to the top Mm -hmm. because they are outdoor workers. They're not insulated from the heat and climate change is increasing the temperatures and we're seeing a lot more wildfires Right. So the the air quality issues and the 
exposure to wildfires is what emerged as an area of need. Yeah, I think we talked about this early on in the project when we were doing the research to just figure out what the touch points might be. Ventura County and Santa Barbara County in the whole United States are the places, the two places that have experienced the highest increase in temperatures since global warming began in That's the whole right. U.S. That's right. Isn't that amazing? That's incredible, just that fact alone, and the farm workers are, are exposed to that. And we uncovered a lot of details about just by wearing shirt, something to cover your head and keep the dust out of your mouth, your body t- temperature rises several degrees just because you have to be so uh, insulated from the work that you're doing out in the fields. Right. The pace of work as well, mm-hmm. depending on what you're harvesting, you could be actually following a truck of sorts where, you know, you're like busy. Your your job, right, is to harvest and your pace, the pace at which you're doing it is led by a machine. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> That's what's up. set. Exactly. You got to keep up. And so that pace is is another issue. Yes. So I think on the list, uh, we just met with the farmers today and went through the mm-hmm. list of what the farm worker said. They mm-hmm. wanted... They need more shade. Yes. They need more water that's cool, not hot water. Yes. The water that warms up in the field has got to be cooled so that they can actually cool off when they drink it. Mm, mm-hmm. They need, when the temperature gets over 80 degrees, the law says they have to have 15 minutes, of 15 minute break every 45 minutes, every hour, every mm-hmm. 15 minutes, every hour. Mm-hmm. And the other night, you missed this sadly, but it was amazing when we did the competition between the two teams. Lideres and, and my cop had mixed their folks up and we did a, they've been taking these trainings about what their rights are and what the details, the facts are mm-hmm. about what the impacts of heat are. And so we did a question, we were asking them questions and they got into a kind of a trivia game. They knew the answers. They were competing. They were competitive. It was laughing, screaming, you know, jumping up and down when they got the answers right. But they have the answers. They really are beginning to understand more and more what their rights are. And so... This kind of brings us to the next question. So we're we're doing trainings. Mm-hmm. We're doing monitor right now, right? Our people out, our teams are out monitoring to check the temperatures in the farm worker homes, uh, uh, neighborhoods, sorry. Neighborhoods. neighborhoods. Yes, because that's the other thing that emerged is that it's heat both at work as well as at home or in the community, right? Right. Uh, we're, we're living human beings, and so the, the heat issue affects us everywhere, or can. And so there were the work issues and then also the community issues in terms of, you know, finding cool places. And parks emerged as important because, you know, there's so much overcrowding for a couple of reasons. One, there's a lot of overcrowding because of the low wages, Mm -hmm. high rents, Mm -hmm. (laughs) the combination of that. There are multiple families living, right, in a home, even in an, in the same apartment. Mm-hmm. So uh, that certainly is an impetus for people when they're off of uh, work to want to be out. <laughs> and, and another is that farm workers come from rural communities, right, in their home country, in their home state in Mexico. Even a community like Oxnard is a big city. Mm-hmm. And so being out in the natural environment is something that is, <laughs> uh, to all of us and, and, and to them, especially coming from more rural communities, like they want to be out. And so parks become that place, right, where they can go to. And that can be a natural environment that serves as a cooling center and a place just in general for them to go. And so those heat monitors that the ARC team mm-hmm. and in turn are placing to start to track what the heat levels are in parks around this particular community and and see, you know, what, what needs to be addressed there. Maybe plant trees. We talked yesterday with the, with the mayor of mm-hmm. Oxnard and the supervisor who represents Oxnard mm-hmm. and the people who work at the Farm Worker Resources Center and mm-hmm. public health about the different types of potential actions, planting more trees, making sure the water fountains work, creating other shade structures. Because yes. one of the facts we found out is before global warming began, a farm worker would get hot during the day, then they would go home and it would be cooler at night. They could cool off. Mm. Now they cannot because it stays warm all night. So they they really do need cooling centers and uh, places. It's one of the things that's happening now that we have to really think. It's going to change mm-hmm. the way our neighborhoods and communities look. Yes, yes. And one of the facts that was shared by the Public Health Institute before the group of electeds yesterday was that in terms of weather-related fatalities and deaths, uh, heat 
is number one. Right. And most people don't know that because, right, right there's the, the more obvious weather storms, uh, um, hurricanes and so forth, right, mm-hmm. that capture the news. Mm-hmm. But the sort of low level, everyday constant of heat related illness and death is not widely known as something that needs to be addressed. And so another reason, yeah, why this is so fundamental that we do this work. Yeah. I think you'll remember when we got online and looked at the the data on where the trees are planted, where they're not. The wealthy communities have tons of trees and there's a dearth, there's a lack of trees in these communities. And you get what they call the heat island effect, where the black top of the road and the cement become these absorbers of heat, and then they radiate that heat all night. And you really see it as we've drove around the, driven around the last few days through Oxnard. You can see why that is and where it is. And it seems like it's something you could do a lot about if you just put the resources into it and made the decision. Yes, that's, that's going to be part of the, the work, is to bring this information, bring the direct experience of farm workers before public policymakers and say, this matters, this is a priority. Yeah, to advocate and, and pressure even <laughs> as, as need be, mm-hmm. right, for changes to actually be made. And hopefully the, the new money that the state is putting in, you know, we were just talking about this, that the three point what is it, $3 billion that the state of California is committing over the next three years to resilient communities. Hopefully that's the kind of money we can tap Mm -hmm. to get these trees and Mm -hmm. other things done, Mm -hmm. cooling centers built. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Yeah. But it's and, power building. Yes. And and given right climate change, we are seeing, thankfully, under the new administration federally and uh, in California, you know, for a while now, more investment in addressing climate change and more funding is expected here in California. And that's why we need more organizations on the ground, social justice, environmental justice organizations rooted in communities of color, led and operated by people of color that that really come from those same communities to be resourced and to be at the table because you could have all the money in the world, but if these voices, if these experiences are kept at the margins, then the decisions as to where those funds are allocated, right, right. are going to be ineffective. Right. Then we'll get to the right place. Exactly. We hope you're enjoying the conversation. If you are, please rate our podcast and offer a review. Your voice will help us grow our listener base which helps us sustain the funding to share these conversations with the people and organizations shaping a more just and regenerative future. A future in which the food and farm businesses are helping to solve the largest challenges of our time. So now we can switch to uh, the Mm -hmm. the actual workplace. And Mm -hmm. I know, you know, I know that this has been great concern to you. And over the years, we've talked a lot mm-hmm. about the distrust and the tension between the agricultural community and the farm worker community. In some sense, the need for a different approach. And we can get into that in a second. Mm-hmm. But let's talk about what you think, because the workplace is where the most risk is on a daily basis for a farm worker, because uh, they're out there in the heat and sunstroke, all the things that can happen. And, you know, what do you hope it happens in the fields, at the, in the workplace? What, do you, what would you like to see change? Yeah, well, you heard the answer straight from <laughs> former farm workers in our, our meeting yesterday. Michael, it's pretty basic, and that's both sad, but also speaks to the how fundamental and important this work is. It's sad from the perspective that what we're asking for is employers to follow the law. Mm-hmm. What farm workers need is for that to happen with respect to what you said. They need shade. It's that basic. It's hot outside. <laughs> it, it's, it's over, quote unquote, the legal limit of 80 degrees, mm-hmm. right? They need an extra break. Mm-hmm. Right? They need cool water. I mean, those three things are pretty basic. And it took a lot of work. Kudos um, to the legislative work of the UFW, Sierra Lay Foundation, that do a lot of important state policy work on this. Because it's, it had to get on the books, for it to even be legitimized. So the laws are on the books, but as is often said in in farm work, that the laws on the books aren't the laws in the field. And so 
what we're hoping out of this is to make that progress to actually implement the law and save lives, right? I mean, at the core, it's not just about implementing laws. At the core is to save lives. We, we want to save farm worker lives and have them be just healthier on the job, not just survive, but <laughs> be safer and healthier on the job. And how we can do that to start with, one, it's just information, Right. For farm workers to know that these laws exist, that they have legal rights, I'd call them human rights. <laughs> and with that information, though, then to secondly is to give them a, a recourse to uh, opportunities to address you know, the situation when it's not happening. Mm-hmm. So it's the information. Right. It's the intervention. I mean, there's an opportunity here. Michael, as, as you well know, to work with farmers to ensure that, you know, those bad actors are held accountable, that everyone is just quite simply following the law. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was interesting. We had a really interesting conversation today with a group of farmers, thoughtful farmers, farmers that mm-hmm. you, you know of that are, are kind of on the cutting edge of have been willing to oper- work together with farm worker groups to try and figure out better ways. You know, it was an interesting conversation because it's a complex problem for them having to do with costs, but more importantly, like we got into the tree question. How do you get the trees planted in the, on the edge of the fields? How do you create more shade? Well, it you know it turns out that a lot of these growers don't even own the land. <laughs> so mm-hmm. the question of who's going to plant the tree and take care of the tree, because they might only be there a year or two because they only lease the ground for two to three years. So this is the system challenge mm-hmm. that requires creative thinking, public policy, A switching, what we really got into is we're subsidizing the wrong things. The wrong things are subsidized Mm. in this country around agriculture. We should be subsidizing the creation of shade. Mm. Because then it's not falling on the grower because Mm -hmm. the public wants cheap food. Okay, well, how you get cheap food? You have to shave your costs. Well, if we're forcing all the costs to be taken out on labor, we're going to have sick killed farm workers. Mm -hmm. So we got to figure out another way to make these things happen. And it may not even involve the grower. It might involve the owner of that land who's Mm -hmm. leasing it, who lives in San Francisco or Mm -hmm. LA and leases the land. Or it might be farm labor contractors who are kind of this space between the actual farm workers in the field and the grower, which can make it very difficult to enforce things because you, if you go to the grower, they'll say, well, it's the contractor. And then the contractor mm-hmm. will say, well, it's the, you know. So it, these are complex challenges that require a lot more attention, it seems to me, than has been given in the past. And that's why public policy folks, that's why CRLA has been so important, UFW, mm-hmm. the work that you've been doing here, MECOP, all these groups that are here, there just needs to be more attention to it. And I mean, sadly, climate change is forcing it, but I'm hoping there'll be more focus on it because California has a huge problem. There aren't enough farm workers anymore. Mm-hmm. They go to construction if they can get a job in construction, right? Restaurants were really damaged during the pandemic. Right. And I think that these points are important to lift up in terms of the interconnectedness with people throughout the state, throughout the country. Right. You mentioned in terms of, well, who owns the land? Right. It could be a landowner out of the Bay Area, out of L.A. Right. And so if you live in the Bay Area, if you uh, live in L.A. and you know that your fresh fruits and vegetables come from these places, right, that you have a vested interest and, and, and power, right, in that community to invest in solidarity, right, to lift up farm workers. So even though you're not living in a farm worker community, <laughs> this knowledge, hopefully, right, it shows your connection to it right. and where you might have leverage or power to help make a difference. Because, and you have the vote and you have exactly. your dollars where you right. spend your dollars. That's right. What companies do you support? That's right. Mm-hmm. Where do you buy your food out of? So those are three simple things you talked about, shade, breaks, and cool water. Yes. Let's talk about OSHA. We got into it a little bit. Mm, They enforce the laws around labor. Yes. Worker health and safety. Worker health and safety. One of the challenges is that we've learned about this weekend, I did, I didn't really realize this, that when OSHA gets a complaint, if it's anonymous, they pay less attention to it. If the complainant gives their name, they'll pay more attention to it. But there's a risk to a farm worker because then there can be retaliation. They can get fired by the person that employs them or given bad jobs or whatever. So 
Cal OSHA is a challenge. This is just another perturbation in this complexity. I mean, what are we going to do about things like that? I mean, do you guys ever have to engage Cal OSHA here? So that is a, a, a looming problem, and their mission is absolutely needed. They're incredibly under-resourced. Mm-hmm. We did an evaluation several years ago, and the per-worker inspector numbers at Cal OSHA is like half of what Oregon invests mm-hmm. in terms of having people staff right, who can go out and do independent inspections. And that's a problem because you have thoughtful, responsible employers. And we know that there are many irresponsible employers. And the only way that they are going to become responsible if there's accountability. And there is no accountability right now. As I said, there's laws, but for laws to actually be in effect requires accountability. Mm -hmm. And we have in multiple areas ways to enforce. Mm -hmm. And Cal OSHA doesn't have the personnel to do sufficient inspections. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what we need. And they need to be um, unannounced inspections because what we hear from farm workers time and time again is when the employer knows that there's going to be an inspection, of course, what do they do? They make sure that on that day, everything is at code. And so they need to be unannounced inspections. Mm -hmm. I think that even with the anonymous complaints. There's two things to that. One is Cal OSHA gets very little tips, period, because the information is not getting to farm workers in terms of where they can even call, Mm -hmm. right? And if there's nobody that picks up, very few of them are even going to leave a message. Right. And if someone picks up, do they even speak Spanish? Mm -hmm. Do they have language justice access for migrant indigenous farm workers? Yeah. Let alone Mixteco or, or Zapotec or, or all the other languages. Exactly. So let's say that the system was in place where farm workers could easily call in. And even if it was anonymously, you would get some helpful information even just from that. Because if there's a, a problematic employer, you can bet that a pattern will start to emerge. Oh, You know, we keep getting calls from um, workers who are working in Oxnard. Right. This large state, one of the largest states in the union, it's like, oh, now there's a hot spot, Mm -hmm. right? Let's start doing some unannounced visits in Oxnard. If they come across an employer who's being responsible, great. And if they don't, great as well, right? Because they'll be able to address that. But in general... The word will get around, right? right? Oh, Cal OSHA is making it a point to come out here into our community. I could be next. Therefore, I'm going to start complying. Exactly. Make sure, making exactly. sure that my, my, my farm labor contractor is complying. Yes, yes. So I do think that there's a way where even an anonymous system mm-hmm. could be effective. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think that, that where we're at We do need to think about an anonymous system because the retaliation that you spoke to Mm -hmm. is a much deeper problem. Right. And if we can't ensure protection of farm workers Mm -hmm. when they actually speak up on their legal rights, Mm -hmm. us as advocates, you know, we don't want to expose them to retaliation. It's a it's a fine line. We we have to walk in terms of, yes, you need to speak up when we know that their livelihood could be put in jeopardy. So I think that the anonymous systemic issue, I think, is still relevant and important to tackle Mm -hmm. as we also need to tackle retaliation because it happens. Yeah, and that's a a really interesting point about maybe one of the things you do is you to address Cal OSHA, say, look, we want you to track and then jump on those places where you have hotspots of of challenge. That's Mm -hmm. a really... That would be something to explore as a possible. Yeah. So uh, aside from farm workers, whether it's garment workers, whether, you know, it's car wash workers, there's many worker sectors that are hurting because Cal OSHA is really inadequate. And so what I'm seeing is we're all sort of coming to this place of Cal OSHA 
Needs fixing. Needs fixing. So we anticipate seeing uh, more of a focus. But I will well, say— Well, I've seen bills in the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. There is more legislation you can see focus on Calosha. Yeah. I want to come back to where do farmers, where do growers, thoughtful growers land on this? Because there, there's pushback even from, from them on this point. Which point? The, the point of, Cal, of Calosha. Like they mm-hmm. don't want un, uh, unannounced. unannounced inspections, right? And, and we have to figure this out because it's— it seems that a group of great, thoughtful, caring growers have a role to play as leaders mm-hmm. in their field to say, we need to raise the bar across the industry because we're doing the right thing. Yeah, we want to hold help, everybody, hold to the everyone right. to the same standard. And because what we hear so often just consistently is, this blanket statement of, you know, everyone knows the law, everyone's following the law. Mm-hmm. Well, nobody does that in any sector. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. <laughs> and um, we need to listen to farm workers and what their experience is. It's not happening across the, across the sector. Right. It reminds me of a lot of things that are coming up in our culture right now. Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement. It's like believe what people are saying. Mm -hmm. Because for so long, there's been denial about what people say, whether it's women complaining about sexual harassment at work or police brutality for black men and women. I mean, we're in this time in our culture where people are saying, believe, Mm -hmm. trust what's being said. It's being said so often, you've got to trust what's being said. Yes, and that speaks to why organizing and social movements have always been what actually gets this country to its ideals, right? right? This justice for all Mm. has only come about because people have organized to essentially say, believe us, right? What we're experiencing, Mm -hmm. you, the policymaker, you, the landowner, you, the corporate owner, believe us, the ones that are uh, on the ground that are, you know, working in your factories that are working, you know, in your fields, believe us about what's going on. Mm -hmm. That is the work of organizing. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you bring up uh, Black Lives Matter and you had raised the question about, you know, what would I want to tell farmers? What would be the message to farmers? The message to farmers is that farm worker justice is a racial justice issue. We can say that now. It's always been that. But we can say that now thanks to the Black Lives Matter movement, to George Floyd, to all the countless. Breonna Taylor. Breonna Taylor. Mr. Castillo. Yeah, all of them. All of them. Because it's brought this country to face the the 400 year reality of white supremacy, Mm -hmm. institutionalized and legalized and racism that we're, we're now here at this point where we can say that, uh, it's always been the case, but where we can say that and we're starting to grapple with it more directly, I think more honestly and most, more transparently, it's incredibly painful. And people, you know, obviously can be really offended by white supremacy saying that that exists institutionally, yeah. <laughs> not just in terms of, you know, clear bigotry. Right. right. The Proud Boys and so forth. Right. Uh, but in our systems, it's a, it's in the DNA of this country. And we need to grapple with it. So farm worker justice is about racial justice. Mm-hmm. So that is another level that we need to speak to because it's going to be painful. Yeah, but, it is painful. But it offers, I think, a higher calling. Right. Mm-hmm. That, yes, it's about in the past it was at. It's about our self-interest, right? Farm workers need jobs. Growers, you know, want to keep their business. We have the self-interest to keep the economic viability, right, of the farm. And that requires protections of workers. And that is true. But this gets us at at the deeper level of who we are as human people. Uh, It gets to the heart. It gets to the heart of it. And so I think that while it's a more painful journey, a more painful conversation, it's an, it's a necessary one, it's a real one, but it gets at the heart, too, of us becoming more human, more connected to our heart, not just our, our mind, but to our heart and to who are we in community with. Yeah. Who are we on this increasingly threatened planet with? Who mm. are we going to depend on each other? We're going to have to depend on each other in the years ahead. I mean, I... 
you've seen it through the Thomas fire here. I've seen it through three fires in Sonoma County. I mean, you start to really start to think about your neighbors in different ways because these are crisis situations and every person counts to make it through whatever's going on. We all have to be better. If these racial divides exist, it makes it hard to have that happen. People miss an opportunity to lessen the suffering for everyone by not coming together. So, yeah, these are deep questions, and I have really appreciated you, you. You were the first one to really say this to me about the farm workers. It's um, that we need to approach this conversation differently. It's a racial justice issue. It's an issue of the heart. And how do we get to people opening their hearts to each other? Because that's where you get the trust is opening your hearts to each other. I am an optimist, and I'm a white male, 60 years old. I lived through the peak of the United States, and I had all the opportunity. So it's easy for me to be sanguine or more believe that things can get better because of my life experience. If I was a black male or I was a farm worker out in the field like Juvenal was, I might have a very different feeling about what's possible. I really might. I see that. I don't want to give up my positivity, but I want to be sensitive to the differences in how people are looking at it, what's possible, because it's very different lenses. And so this gets me to my final question for you, because we're about out of time. As I just said, we live in a world with a huge amount of challenges coming more intensely all the time. But you remain full of heart and at work on this stuff on a daily basis. You've been doing it for years. Your life Mm -hmm. has been dedicated to it. So I'm really curious, what gives you hope and the energy to continue getting up every day and, and pushing hard on a very difficult thing to change. Mm. What keeps me going is actually, you'd be surprised, maybe optimism. It doesn't have to be this way. It can be different. Mm. I think that's the driving force of anyone who is in activism, who is in social justice, is we believe that it can be better, <laughs> That's why we're in it. Otherwise, we would be hopeless and apathetic and do something else, right? But it can be better. It can be different. Today, we have the brain power, the money, the relationships, the organizations. Everything is here that we need to end suffering, to end food hunger, pick any issue. We do have the resources, So that's one thing that keeps me going is I absolutely believe that things can be different. Different. Uh Secondly, you know, our ancestors, all those who have come before, I could name names. We all could name names of particular public figures or personal figures even, right, of people that inspire us. Mm -hmm. But I want to speak to the, the millions of people that we will never know their name. Mm -hmm. Not just in the past, but today. Mm -hmm. The millions of people who in one way or another are working for social change. Mm -hmm. Because the other thing that hurts us in America is our hero complex, Mm -hmm. our heroine complex, right? This myth of any one individual, one hero, that really sets us back. So I am inspired knowing And certainly here at Cause, because we do organizing. (laughs) (laughs) I know that there are hundreds, thousands, uh, and across the country, millions of people who are being organized, who are organizers. And that it's because of them that this social change happens. Mm -hmm. The third, we need to speak to this, especially in America. We are a country that's suffering from mental health issues, from from spiritual health issues. We're the most stressed out nation (laughs) In the planet, right? So our mental health, part of what holds us back is that we're all stressed out mm-hmm. <laughs> and that we're not connected to what um, nourishes us and what inspires us on a daily basis. And so I'm on a lifelong journey <laughs> of my own internal care. Mm-hmm. And the last thing I'll share is that what what isn't helping me to- <laughs> Mm. And I'm not attending to is my physical health. Mm. Mm. I know it's hard. (laughs) Um, And that that probably holds me back is not Mm. attending to my physical health. And and I say that because, you know, those of us who have these platforms to speak to, you know, whoever is listening, we often just speak of the things that we're doing well, right, or that are working well for us. 
And I think that it's helpful to, that that we humanize ourselves and one another, right? That even whatever it is that, that we're doing and we, we seem to be successful at or that we're leading or driving, right? That there are things that still need to be attended to that we're grappling with. We're human in that way, right? If I attend to my physical health, I could be even more. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. Point to self. <laughs> right, right. No, it's true. It's Whatever true. it is that people, you know, know of themselves, right? If mm-hmm. I were attending to this for myself, right, then I would be even more powerful to do the things that I want to do. Well said. Good reminder for mm-hmm. us all. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to say thank you. It's been a very, as always, a very good conversation and leaves me inspired and even more of a fan of, of all your good work and your years and the joy. You, you laugh a lot when you speak and it comes out, your enthusiasm. And I remember that from the years when you were leading our board. And it's, it's, so it's really nice to, to have a conversation with you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And thank you to our sponsors, the Ladybug Foundation, Dan and Quincy Imhoff, Beth and Mark Wyatt, Cindy Daniel, and Doug Lipton. Roots of Change is a program of the Public Health Institute.